Sirah, a biography of Muhammad, the last messenger of Allah, written by Professor Dr. Safwat Khalilovic. Chapter 43 Events of the Years 4 and 5 in Noah Hijrai in the morning following their return to Medina, the Prophet, peace be upon him, ordered the combatants of the Battle of Uhud to get ready and attack the pagan troops retreating toward Mecca. The objective of that operation was to protect Medina from a potential attack and demonstrate to the enemy that the Muslims were not defeated despite casualties suffered at Uhud. Although exhausted by the events at Uhud, the companions accepted the Prophet's suggestion unquestioningly. The Muslim troops, led by the Prophet, got on their way, and when they reached the place called Hamra al-Assad, eight miles of Medina, they camped there, taking advantage of their own size and armament. The pagans tried to put pressure on the Muslims, but they failed to make the Muslims waver or scared. Allah revealed. Those whose faith only increased when people said, Fear your enemy, they have amassed a great army against you, and who replied, God is enough for us, he is the best protector. The third chapter, verse 173. Having seen the resolve and the firmness of the Muslim troops, the pagans decided to retreat toward Mecca and not engage in a new battle with them. Owing to this operation, the Prophet, peace be upon him, succeeded in lifting the morale of the Muslim fighters, which was very important after Uhud. In addition to it, the political standing of the nascent Muslim state would have been considerably shaken without a counteraction to the defeat at Uhud. Many Arab tribes would have swiftly attacked Medina, and the Muslims would have been exposed to great danger. The swift post-Uhud reaction showed that the Muslims were determined fighters, and that one defeat could not halt them. This is an important lesson to Muslims. One should never show weakness in front of an enemy, but firmness and resolve. The campaign against the Banu Nadir in the fourth Enoah Hijrai. After the Battle of Uhud, God's Prophet undertook several military operations in order to intermediate enemies and restore the reputation of the Muslim community. One such operation was the raid against the Banu Asad, commanded by Abu Salama ibn Abdul Asad, in the month of Muharram, 4 AH, the fourth of Anoah Hijrai. In that same month, Abdullah ibn Unais launched his raid against Muslim enemies, and the Muslims triumphed in both campaigns. Two tragic events happened in the month of Safar of the same year. In the places of al raji and Bir Mauna, the Prophet's companions, who had been sent as teachers of Islam to the tribes in these places, were killed. These events greatly saddened the Prophet, peace be upon him. Siras record a very interesting story about the killing of companions Hubayb ibn Adi and Asim ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhuma. At the request of the Banu Lihian tribe, the Prophet sent six companions to teach Islam to them. However, their hosts betrayed them and handed them over to the hostile tribe of Huzail. Although the six of them fought heroically, four died as martyrs, including the group leader Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, and two were captured and sent to Mecca as a blood money, one of them being Hubayb ibn Adi radiallahu anhu. The pagans decided to crucify him alive. Before the execution, he asked to be allowed to perform two cycles of the ritual prayer, they allowed it, and he did so, and when he finished, he told them, By God, had I not feared, you would think I'm afraid of you, I would have prayed longer. After that, they crucified him, dying he prayed, O Allah, defeat and destroy them all, and do not leave a single one alive. Hubayb's prayer had such an effect on his executioners that they froze in fear and fell to the ground. 
This true believer then recited the following verses. When I am killed as a Muslim, it does not matter on which side I will fall for the sake of Allah. Having heard these verses, Quraysh Lord Abu Sufyan asked Hubayb, Don't you wish that you were with your family and Muhammad were in your place? No, by Allah, said Hubayb. I would not like to be with my family now, and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, were hurt by a thorn there where he is now. That is what the great companion, Hubayb ibn Adi, radiallahu anhu, said, and we say, O oh, exalted Allah, please reward Hubayb and make us love Prophet Muhammad as Hubayb did, and gather us together in paradise. This example is indicative of the companion's love for God's Prophet and the extent of the sacrifice they were ready to make for Islam. Hubayb radiallahu anhu does not wish Muhammad to be in his shoes. Moreover, he does not even wish the Prophet to be hurt by a thorn wherever he may be at the moment. How strong and unwavering his faith is! Great Islamic scholar Hafiz al Zahabi states that the Hubayb ibn Adi was the first person in Islam who prayed two cycles before execution in the path of God, a fine act and inauguration of a fine tradition. Biographers also recorded that this companion was seen eating grapes in captivity, as there were no grapes at all in Mecca. At that time, we can conclude that it was one of the miracles that Allah bestowed on Hubayb in this world. Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu was the leader of the group that the Prophet dispatched to the Banu Lihyan. He got killed in the clash with the Huzail tribe. Quraysh dispatched a party to retrieve his body in order to be sure that he was dead, since Asim had killed one Quraysh lord in the Battle of Badr. However, the pagans could not approach his body since Allah sent a swarm of bees to protect it. Asim radiallahu anhu had earlier prayed to Allah that no pagan hand should touch his body, and his prayer was answered. When Umar radiallahu anhu heard of this, he said, Allah the Exalted verily protects his believing slave after his death, just as he does during his life. The Medinian Jews and the hypocrites used the tragic events at Araji and Bir Ma'una to recall Quraysh victory at Uhud in order to chip on the credibility of the messenger and the companions and call into question the future of the nascent state. The messenger realized that the hypocrites and the Jews were scheming and something needed to be done to foil their plans. The Jewish tribe of Banu Nadir lived in the vicinity of Medina, and they were known as the confederates of the Hazraj tribe. They made a peace and cooperation pact with the Muslims. However, they were prone to treason and fraud, which made them breach the pact. Biographers state that the Prophet, peace be upon him, once visited them with a group of companions. The Jews had devised a plan to kill him by throwing a large stone on him from a rooftop. The Prophet sensed something was going on, so he jumped, saying that he had an urgent errand to tend to and set off to Medina. The companions soon caught up with him, and he told them about the intentions of the Banu Nadir. He then sent Muhammad ibn Maslama to tell the Jews that they had to leave Medina because of treason. They were given ten days to move out. After the ultimatum, the Banu Nadir prepared for the move, but Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the leader of the Hippocrates, sent an envoy to dissuade them from migration and tell them that Ubay would send two thousand men to defend them. So the Jews changed their minds and gave up the migration. They fortified themselves and sent a message to the Prophet. We shall not leave our homes, and you can do whatever you want. After that, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions set out toward the Banu Nadir. Ali radiallahu anhu was the standard bearer. 
When the Jews noticed the Muslims, they started shooting arrows and throwing stones at them. The assistance promised to them by the Hippocrates leader was not arriving. The Muslims held them surrounded for several days, whereupon the Jews agreed to move out, and the Prophet allowed them to do so, under the condition that they would not carry weapons and would take only as much wealth as their camels could carry. In return, their lives would be protected, and not a single drop of their blood would be shed. While they were leaving, they grabbed everything they could and pulled down their houses so that the Muslims could not use them. One part of the tribe settled in Hyber, a place some hundred miles away from Medina, the other in the region of Jerash, in southern Al-Sham. Only two Jews converted to Islam. Surah 59. The gathering was revealed with respect to this battle. It was he who drove those of the people of the book, who broke faith out from their homes at the first gathering of forces. You never thought they would go, and they themselves thought their fortifications would protect them against God. God came up on them from where they least expected and put panic into their hearts. Their homes were destroyed by their own hands and the hands of the believers. Learn from this, all of you with insight. If God had not decreed exile for them, he would have tormented them in this world. In the hereafter, they will have the torment of the fire because they set themselves against God and his messenger. God is stern in punishment towards anyone who sets himself against him. The 59th chapter, verses from 2 to 4. The defeat of Ben Nadir and their migration out of Medina was very important for several reasons. The first, the Muslims got hold of large spoils of war, which were mostly distributed to the emigrants since they had left their property in Mecca. The second, further presence of the hostile Benu Nadir Jews in Medina might have led to civic unrest since, with their proclivity to treachery and fraud, they continually encouraged the Hippocrates and their plotting against the Muslims. The third, Whenever Medina was under attack, the Jews posed a threat, as they always sided with the enemy. It is important to stress here that the expulsion of the Banu Nadir from Medina was a result of their treason and breach of the pact they had concluded with the Prophet and the Muslims. Another two events marked the year 4 in Ahidraya. The fact that a retaliation battle at Badr did not take place in the month of Shaban and a campaign known as the Turika. Quraysh leader Abu Sufyan had vowed that he would command another battle against the Muslims on the anniversary of the Battle of Uhud. But he went back home because the year was rainless and fruitless, which he considered to be a bad omen. The Prophet had prepared well for the battle, made encampment with the Muslim army at Badr, but the battle did not occur. Verses 168-175 to of Surah 3, the family of Imran, were revealed with respect to this event. When the Prophet returned to Medina, he received the news that one group from the tribe of Katafan in Najd was mounting an army against him. He decided to surprise them before they finished their preparations. Having gathered several hundred troops, he set out to a journey of around 300 kilometers. That campaign was called the Turika. The Muslims did not have enough camels, so six men would take turn on one camel. Abu Musa al-Ashari described the journey. The six of us turns on one camel. The journey was so exhausting that our clothes were torn, our toenails fell off, and our feet were sore, so we would shred the remaining clothes into strips and wrap our feet in them. 
when the Muslims reached their destination, they carried out a surprise assault. Their enemies fled, leaving behind their equipment and wealth. The Battle Against the Confederates Ghazwatul Ahzab this battle, also known as the Battle of the Trench, Handak, took place in the month of Shawwal, the fifth year of Enohidrai, which started on the 23rd February 627 CE. After the expulsion of the Banu Nadir, their exiled leaders went to Mecca, inciting Quraysh to fight Prophet Muhammad. The call Quraysh heeded. Then the Banu Nadir leaders went to the Gatafan tribe, where the Banu Fazara and the Banu Mura clans heeded their call and heeded toward Medina. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, learned of that movement, he sought advice from his companions. Salmon al Farisi proposed that they dig a trench, Arabic handak, around Medina in the line of potential attack. The proposal was accepted, and the Prophet ordered the digging to begin and personally participated in that huge enterprise. During the digging, the Prophet, peace be upon him, demonstrated to the companions several miracles, supernatural acts, the privilege bestowed on him by the Almighty God. When Quraysh and their confederates arrived, some 10,000 troops in total. They were surprised by the trench, as such war stratagem was unknown to Arabs. Huyei ibn Ahtab, who had also engaged in inciting Quraysh and the confederates to fight the Muslims, visited Kab ibn Asad, the chief of the Banu Quraysh, a Jewish tribe that lived inside Medina, and asked him to breach peace treaty with the Muslims. Kab hesitated in the beginning, but Huyei was persistent and managed to persuade the Banu Quraysh to breach the treaty and join the confederates. This considerably aggravated the position of the Muslims, as the Jews could now attack from within. The Prophet wanted to make another treaty with the Banu Quraysh and offer them one-third of the Medinian crops, but the Ansar, proud of their religion, disagreed with this proposal, as they were of the opinion that traitors did not deserve to be given anything. The battle started after some pagan horsemen managed to jump across the trench at its narrowest point. The Muslims were ready for that raid and killed them. Soon afterward, Nuaym ibn Masud came to see the Prophet and told him that he had embraced Islam, that his people still did not know about it, that he was a friend of the Banu Quraysh, who had great confidence in him, and asked the Prophet to give him some task. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told him, For us, you are only an individual who can do little as an ordinary fighter, so try to turn the enemies away from us as much as you can with trickery, for war is trickery. Nuaym indeed employed trickery and managed to set at odds Quraysh and their supporters on one side and the Banu Quraysh on the other, as he caused each side to doubt the intentions. Meanwhile, in one very cold night, God Almighty sent a terrible storm on the army of the Confederates. Wind overturned their cauldrons and tore tents to pieces. This caused panic in their ranks, and the fear was so immense that they left their positions that same night. At dawn, the Muslims could not see a single enemy fighter. God Almighty revealed several Quranic verses about that battle, and one whole surah is named after it. That is Surah 33rd, the Joint Forces, also translated as the Confederates. It contains the following verses. You who believe, remember God's goodness to you, when mighty armies massed against you. We sent a violent wind and invisible forces against them. God sees all that you do. They massed against you from above and below. Your eyes rolled, your hearts rose into your throats, and you thought thoughts of God. 
There the believers were sorely tested and deeply shaken. The 33rd chapter, verses from 9 to 11. This surah also describes the stance of the Hippocrates, their treachery and retreat from the battle verses from 12 to 15. It then goes on to present the view of the devout believers. When the believers saw the joint forces, they said, This is what God and his messenger promised us. The promise of God and his messenger is true, and this only served to increase their faith and submission to God. There are men among the believers who honored their pledge to God. Some of them have fulfilled it by death, and some are still waiting. They have not changed in the least, so that God may reward the truthful for their honesty and punish the hypocrites, if he so wills, or he may relent towards them, or he may relent towards them, for God is forgiving and merciful. God sent back the disbelievers along with their rage. They gained no benefit and spared the believers from fighting. He is strong and mighty. The 33rd chapter, verses from 22 to 25. Sira authors recorded the following. The digging of the trench around Medina was an extremely exhausting activity. There was a shortage of food at the time, and the diggers were hungry. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu wanted to treat the Prophet to a lunch, and he told his wife to cook a meal. She told him that what she cooked was sufficient for the Prophet and perhaps two more men, as there was a food shortage. When Jabir invited the Prophet peace be upon him to his place, the Prophet told him to go home and that he would follow with the companions. Jabir became truly worried as he knew that there was not enough food. However, when the Prophet arrived, he told the companions that they should enter in separate groups. He let lit food to each of them and they all ate until they were full. Moreover, there was food left for Jabir's family as well. The traditions about this event are recorded in many seerahs and hadith collections. While digging the trench, the Muslims would come across rocks they were not able to break. In such cases, they would call the messenger of God, peace be upon him, who would break them effortlessly, having recited the Bismillah in the name of God. Salman radiallahu anhu narrates that while breaking one such rock, the Prophet announced the Muslim conquest of Yemen, Persia, and Byzantium. That indeed happened later, and this event tells that the Prophet was a great optimist, even in difficult situations such as that at the time of the Battle of the Trench. Muslim women also took part in the Battle of the Trench. For example, the Prophet's paternal aunt Safiya radiallahu anha, displayed a great courage defending the Muslim rear from the treacherous actions of the Jewish of the Jewish tribe of Ben Kureza. Sira authors recorded that she killed one Jew without hesitation while he was trying to sneak into a tent with Muslim women and children. Many companions showed exceptional courage and readiness for personal sacrifice during the Battle of the Trench. One of them was Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu, who in the night in which God sent strong wind and storm went into the idolaters' camp to listen in and learn of their intents, risking death or captivity.